Now, uh, before we jump in and start talking about medication treatment uh, per se, I want to talk about uh, this, this study that was done. It's now 14 years old, but it was so well done, uh, it, it's found a place, you know, uh, in, in the history of treatment uh, of ADHD. And it's the, they call it the MTA study. And uh, they, they, it was a multi, multi-million dollar study, NIMH supported, and uh, had large uh, sample size. And what they did is they, let me see if I've got Okay, yeah, okay. And, and you, see what, you see who the people are here, okay? And that 80 to 20 is probably representative of what it is in the general population. Uh, com comorbidity, not excluded. That's good because almost every kid that has ADHD has some kind of comorbidity. They have, at the very least, low self-esteem, but a lot of them have depression, a lot of them have anxiety disorders, and stuff like that. But anyway, what they did is they, they, they assigned uh, these kids to a one of four treatment groups, okay? Now, the first one actually began uh, several months before they started the school year in September where they worked with a family and they, they taught them kind of state-of-the-art uh, uh, behavioral approaches for behavioral management, okay? Uh, and, and which has been shown, if you do it the right way, it can be very helpful because they have ADHD, okay? Uh, also, when they start, they started this at the beginning of the school year, it lasted for nine months. And so they had the identified patients in these classrooms. Uh, the parents uh, were ready to go. They, they were managing behavior better. They also uh, met with the, the researchers met with the teacher and said, this kid's got ADHD and we're going to share with you some things that you can do. Plus, and this would never happen in real life ever. They had a, a behavioral technician in the classroom for each one of the kids in this in this particular arm of the study, and if little Timmy started getting you know out of, you know off task or something, uh, he or she would come over and say, "Now you need to get focused again here. You know, pay attention to your work." So one-on-one -on -one attention again that could never happen in the real world. Okay, so that so that was it. Also, if they requested it, they got family therapy. Now let me just say as a digression, the kids that that got family therapy uh, and actually really benefited from this were kids that had comorbid anxiety along with uh, ADHD, okay. Uh, but the majority did not get family therapy, okay, some of, some of them did. Okay, next is stimulant, stimulant medication treatment. And what they did here is they used a protocol uh, that where they, they used aggressive dosing, okay, and uh, it, way beyond what is going to happen in the general community, uh, you know, pediatric setting, okay? Uh, then they, the third one, they combined the first two, and then finally the fourth group was treatment as usual. And so these kids went to their pediatrician and got stimulants and, and that kind of stuff. So what they found was basically, uh, some things were kind of uh, surprising. Uh, one is all three of these worked. Uh, the, con the combined approach actually was not hugely superior to the other groups. You might think it would be, but it, it wasn't significantly better, okay? Uh, but the most surprising thing of all was that the outcomes uh, were equal in this group and in this group, okay? And, and so there's, there's this you know, huge investment of time and energy and resources here, and, and it, but it works, okay? I mean, it really works. Uh, but you get about equal outcomes just by giving, you know, one or two pills a day. So that, that was interesting. The other thing was when they stopped the study, I mean, obviously the parents still knew how to uh, cope with the kids' behavioral problems, but they'd go to the next school year, and they didn't have the behavioral technician. They didn't instruct the teacher about how to handle it, and these kids just collapsed, okay? Now, what you have to do if you're a parent and you got ADHD is every single year parents have to in a real proactive way, go in and, ha and sit down and talk with the teacher and say, look, here's the problem. We've run into it before. And, and, and every year, kind of renegotiate and get the, the teacher on board in terms of understanding uh, the kid's problem and, and that kind of stuff. But, but this sort of thing is like putting training wheels on a bike. You know, <clears throat> As long as it, the support is there, then it seems to work pretty, pretty well. Uh, but if you take the training wheels off, it collapses. It doesn't they didn't really generalize. Now, one factor is that you do have ongoing maturation, and so some kids do get somewhat better just because their brain is becoming more mature, uh, but it, it just didn't generalize to the next year. Okay. Now, the other thing, though, that was found 
uh, was that this was significantly superior to treatment as usual. And the, uh, I don't think I've got the slide in here. Okay, I don't. But what they found was the average dosing in primary care settings, uh, and we'll look at the, the drugs here in a few minutes, and this make, make more sense, is uh, 18 and a half milligrams of Ritalin per day. And the, do, the average dose in the, uh, the, the other treatment uh, that was so much better was 40 milligrams a day. And there's a strong argument uh, that kids tolerate higher doses fine. If you're going to use these drugs, why not get in there and use drugs that really are going to do the trick? Okay? <coughs> right. So, uh, let's jump in here and talk about pharmacologic treatments. Ritalin, of course, is the one that's gotten uh, you know, the most attention, been around for a really long time. Uh, this is now 10 years old. I don't know what the current, uh, the current data is on this, but 5% uh, or more of kids have ADHD, but of those, at least uh, in the year 2000, only 14% were actually getting treatment. So you say, uh, if somebody says, well, do you think uh, Ritalin or, or, or other stimulants are being used too much? I have to say, uh, they're being used too much and they're being used too little, okay? They're being given to a lot of kids that don't really need them, it's inappropriate, and a lot of kids uh, don't get treated, okay? Now, consequences of failure to treat. There now are two good studies that have shown that if you track kids with ADHD to the end of adolescence, those kids that are, have ADHD but never got treated with stimulants, one group. The other group are, are now teenagers who've been on long-term stimulant treatment, okay? The rates of substance abuse in the untreated group is twice what you see in the treated group. And why this is so important is that uh, many parents are going to uh, already know or they get on the internet and they read about this and they're going to say, hey, look, stimulants can be habit forming. And they can be uh, in people that are prone to substance abuse. And parents, understandably, are very worried about, about addiction and that kind of stuff. Uh, but the data is if you don't treat, there's a huge increase in substance abuse. And why? Because with ADHD, it's not just about paying attention to school and doing okay academically. ADHD is pervasive. Their whole life is affected by this. And so they have academic problems and they fail at school repeatedly, but they come home at night and every single night they're, they're, because of the disruptive behavior. This is what happens. Would you leave your sister alone? Would you stop it? You know, I mean, this is, this is, the, this is what happens every single night because these kids are behaviorally out of control. Also, they bug the living hell out of other kids. They're intrusive, you know, they, they, they don't have good boundaries, and invariably, they don't get chosen to be on sports teams. They don't get invited to spend the night, you know. They, they, they don't have good social because they bug kids, okay. And when you start failing academically and you start failing socially and you have family conflict, guess what happens? You get low self-esteem. And what is a solution? a common solution for feeling crappy, feeling depressed and worthless when you're a teenager, and that is drug abuse, right? And, yeah, question? Is there any one drug they tend to use more than another? Uh, well, Ritalin has been used the most because it's been around for a long enough you know, period of time. You mean the abuse? I said you that they use. The abuse. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Is is there a particular substance of abuse? Yeah. 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 Guess what it is. Alcohol. Well, it's alcohol. Meth. It's marijuana. Okay. It's not op uh, opiate abuse. Okay, that's interesting. But also, they they abuse methamphetamine and cocaine. And this is low-level substance abuse, but there's a lot of ADHD kids that don't get treated for ADHD. And if you watch what they do, they're drinking six cans of Mountain Dew each day. Mm -hmm. Caffeine will treat <clears throat> ADHD. The problem is you, get, you have to take high, real high doses such that you get a lot of GI distress and you, and you also have trouble sleeping. Okay. Do you have a question? Well, actually, I think you kind of covered it because I had... I had heard that adults with ADHD um, have high rates of stimulant abuse, um, but then I had heard that um, teenagers that tend to 
not or abuse the other drugs more, but what you said kind of made it clear in my head. So. <laughs> I think we can see that, that, you know, this is true with bipolar disorder, for instance, and with depression. I mean, some of this is just straight-out substance abuse, you know, but part of it also is self-medication. And I think it was adults, you know, that they find that they function better if they drink 10 cups of coffee a day, you know, or use some methamphetamine or something like that. So, uh, the last thing, and then we'll take a break, okay? Uh, interesting study, and as far as I know, uh, there haven't been any other studies since then to verify or replicate this. It hasn't been negated by other researchers. Researchers, I haven't seen it. But what they did is they looked, again, two groups of teenagers, uh, uh, older adolescents, those who have been treated, uh, they both had ADHD, those who have been treated with stimulants and those that weren't, and there was significant difference. And you can see right here, uh, decreased white matter volumes in those that did not get stimulant treatment, and this is primarily in the frontal lobes. And some of the later manifestations of, of brain development are myelinization of subcortical areas wiring up parts of the frontal lobes. And uh, it looks like that not being treated, it, it doesn't develop normally. Now, the, the theory, and it's just a theory, but it kind of makes sense, is could it be that stimulants are neuroprotective? Well, the normal brain is accustomed to having a certain amount of dopamine. Okay, for all of us. <clears throat> what if over a period of years you have dramatically less availability of dopamine? Might that change the chemical environment that otherwise uh, would be necessary for appropriate maturation of the frontal lobe? So it's something that's intriguing. Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk about, about stimulants. And uh, these treatments have been around since the 1960s. And I, and I want to mention that. Uh, there were, enough, there were 20 lawsuits brought uh, against the, uh, a company that made Ritalin uh, back, I think it was in the 1970s or early 80s. Uh, turns out that uh, they were sponsored, or the, the attorneys were paid for by the Church of Scientology, uh, all 20 lawsuits. And there's been this ongoing battle between the Psy American Psychiatric Association and the Church of Scientology. And so, uh, is just, you know, commentary on some, some of the, you know, media kind of issues that get kicked up because of medication treatment. But anyway, in terms of stimulants, uh, lots and lots of studies uh, with kids and have been around for a long time. Safest uh, psychiatric medication. Let, let, me, let, let me just mention this, okay? And, and that is there, there have been 25 deaths of children uh, Canada, the United States, in the in the last uh, ten years, uh, these kids are taking stimulants, and it caused concern. And for a while, the Canadian version of FDA banned the use of Adderall, uh, but then they 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 allowed that now to be used again. And it turns out that uh, the base rate of sudden death in children on uh, kids taking stimulants is really uh, no different than the, the base rate in the general population. And every one of these cases uh, on autopsy they found that the kids had uh, evidence of pre-existing, actually pretty severe cardiac disease that had been uh, undiagnosed before starting treatment. And so <coughs> here, um, here, here's what you need to do to just absolutely make sure it's not going to put kids at risk because stimulants increase heart rate a little bit, increases blood rate a little bit. So for most kids, it's no big deal. But if you have a family history of cardiac disease, also a family history of sudden infant death syndrome, okay, uh, then uh, those are risk factors, okay. Or if you have any of the following symptoms, okay, uh, one is called syncope which is unexplained fainting, okay, uh, where people just lose consciousness and faint. If you have a uh, rapid heart rate, if there's been a history of, inf uh, excuse me, of fetal alcohol or other substance abuse exposure, then these are risk factors that suggest that you need to do a do cardiac screening before prescribing a stimulant. And it's as simple as getting an EKG. 
And if that comes back normal, then you can prescribe the stimulants and there's really no problem at all. Okay. Uh, one reason I want to mention that is this is, again, one of those things where uh, if parents get on the internet, they may see ooh, look a sudden death associated with the use of Adderall or Ritalin or what have you, and that's the current state of affairs. So FDA, is their position on it is there's no uh, reason to think that these are unsafe medications. In fact, they, again, they're the safest medicine in all psychiatry. Mechanism of action. All of the stimulants are dopamine reuptake inhibitors, okay? Uh, in addition, though, amphetamine, it's a dopamine reuptake inhibitor, but amphetamine also increases the rate of the release of dopamine, okay? And so, you know, just like, uh, you know, the, with the serotonin reuptake inhibitors and that kind of stuff, uh, fast action, usually you take a stimulant and within 45 minutes to an hour, it's up in the brain, it's blocking dopamine receptors. So guess what? It just allows for the accumulation of more dopamine in the synapse rapidly. And as long as that is sustained, as long as the drug is active, then it normalizes brain functioning in, in the frontal lobes. And if you ever work with kids with ADHD, but it's dramatic. I mean, it's, it's huge. Okay, so uh, there are three classes of stimulants, and methylphenidate is Ritalin. Uh, but then there are a lot of Ritalin clones. You can look in your quick reference uh, to psychiatric medications, and you'll see drugs like Concerta, Metadate, Focalin, and so forth. They're, they're, they're all derived from the this, this same molecule, methylphenidate. They differ in terms of whether they're immediate release or if they are uh, uh, sustained release and, and that kind of stuff. They, they, uh, but the, but the, the compound itself is the same thing. Uh, dextroamphetamine is uh, dexedrine, okay, and it's been around for a long time, and amphetamine is Adderall, okay. A Adderall has actually two variants of, of amphetamine. Uh, actually, this is just hard to believe, but FDA has approved the use of methamphetamine for the treatment of ADHD. Nobody in their right mind would prescribe it, you know, because even if, though it works for treating ADHD, you know what's going to happen? Their parents are going to take it or the kids are going to sell it you know, or something like that. So anyway, uh, Vyvanse is a, uh, it is a pro-drug, okay? And if you remember, a pro-drug is a drug that doesn't become active until it is metabolized in the liver. And so this drug is a stimulant, but it can, you can't abuse it by smoking it or snorting it uh, or injecting it into a vein, okay? And uh, the drug company came out with this thinking that it would result in less abuse potential for that reason. It has to, has to be swallowed, go through the liver, and then it's, it is metabolized into uh, the drug that, that works. It's a pro-drug. Okay. Datrona is uh, methylphenidate, which is uh, Ritalin, but it's in a transdermal patch like the nicotine patch. You put it on your skin and you have to replace it every day. Now, I, I don't really know that this is going anywhere uh, because of this. It requires three hours before it reaches therapeutic blood levels and usually Kids wake up and, and, you know, they're wild and they're making funny noises and bugging everybody until the Ritalin or Adderall gets in their brain 45 minutes later and then they're okay till it wears off. What you'd have to do here is you'd have to uh, give it to the kid. Uh, you'd have to sneak into their bedroom like, at, you know, 5 in the morning or something like that, you know, and stick, it, stick a patch on. Uh, some parents probably do that. I mean, sometimes, uh, especially with severe ADHD, that first hour in the morning is just like, it's really, you know, it's bad news. But anyway, it, should, it may just be a, a marketing kind of thing, trying to you know, make, make more money. Okay, now, uh, if, if you look across studies, uh, these are impressive outcomes, okay? If you just treat kids, uh, this assumes that, that they really have ADHD, okay? Uh, with appropriate doses, of, uh, which are high doses, okay, of stimulants, 72% uh, have good to excellent responses. Systematic trials, it goes up to 92%, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. When the drug is in their, in their uh, body at adequate blood levels, 
somewhere between a half and two thirds, they look completely normal in terms of their cognitive functioning, impulse control, and so on and so forth. And look at the effect size. Again, uh, one of the highest uh, that you find in psychiatry. Now, uh, however, if you give it to uh, kids that are really young, and you better believe it, some people are getting treatment for kids that are three and four or five years old, uh, the, the response rate is much lower, but you see it starts increasing and by about the age of six or seven, now you're up to these rates here. And, and the likelihood is this is because the dopamine system is still coming online maturationally, so it's not target, it's not able to have an impact because the system itself isn't really fully operational yet, but good outcomes. Now, this is what you see uh, in, in a uh, you know, number of different kinds of studies where they look at metabolic brain functioning. Over here on the left-hand side, it looks like there's a hole in the brain in the left frontal lobe and also other areas in the left hemisphere, but it's not a hole in the brain. This is just a particular part of the brain where the metabolic activity is way below normal, okay? And one hour after taking a stimulant, it's become completely normalized. Uh, so, so for pra all practical purposes, most of these kids, once the drug is really on board, uh, they, fun they can function just fine. The downside is that the drug wears off, and you can't take it late in the afternoon or evening because it'll keep you awake. And so that's, that's where there are problems. But when it's uh, there during the daytime, then the results are, are very impressive. What's been found <coughs> is that, uh, gosh, why didn't I put that slide? Well, I'll just, I'll just tell you about this, okay? What's been found is that 38% uh, of kids who are given a stimulant, if you do trials on the different classes of drugs, one of those drugs will, will stand out as being the best, okay? The rest of kids, which is you know the majority, about two thirds of kids, they're all it's, they're equally effective. Now you, you know this is not a common in psychiatry. You say, well, yeah, but they all supposedly work the same way, so why aren't they equivalent? And the, and the answer to that question is, uh, who knows? Okay, but here here's the, the practical reality of this. Okay, what happens is you get a kid, and maybe they they've been you know a huge behavioral problem for years, and so finally the parents take them in, and the pediatrician. Uh, gives them, some, and let's just say Ritalin, it could be any of the drugs or Adderall, but let's say they give them Ritalin and they go home and they give them the medication and within an hour it's like, whoa, why didn't we do this two years ago? Uh, and so they, they stay on the drug and, uh, and it works and continues to work and parents and teachers and everybody uh, are, are pleased with that. But what you don't know is could this kid be in that group, third of kids, that actually might do better on Adderall because of because the success of this is so good that you just stay with it. I mean, why try to fix something that's not broken? However, if you want to get up to, from 72 to that 92 percent effectiveness rate, then the way to go is to take a month and with a trial on one class of medicine, like Ritalin, methylphenidate, a month on Adderall, and a month on Dexedrine. Two-thirds of these kids it's going to be equivalent, no big differences, but a third of them, one of them is going to actually, hey, this is really, this really is better. Now, if you do that and you multiply that times the years of a child's life, you know, grade school, junior high, and beyond, the effect could be significant. So the people that are experts are saying two things about treatment. One is don't pussyfoot around, use good aggressive dosing. And you know you never uh, you don't want to get to the point where you get side effects, but you try to really push it, get the maximum benefit, and do systematic trials. Okay, and a lot of kids uh, are going to find out one drug uh, actually is superior to the other two classes of drugs. Now, uh, what else can you do? Well, the biggest problem really is uh, dealing with uh, evening hours. Okay, because it's not just about getting homework done. But it's because absolute chaos occurs in many of these families at night because the kid is, you know, really out of control. And somebody, I don't remember, the conference said, hey, you mix siblings and ADHD and it's explosive. And, and, and so it really makes a big difference. So it would be nice to be able to have a drug you could use uh, that's going to provide a benefit in the evening. But again, you can't take stimulants because they'll, they'll keep you awake at night. So this is where antidepressants can be effective. 
Uh, the two antidepressants are Welbutrin and Stratera, and we're gonna, we'll talk about each one of those. Uh, also, uh, just as an adjunct uh, or augmentation, you can add uh, alpha-2 agonist, which would be clonidine or guampacine. And actually, uh, these drugs uh, uh, cause, can cause sedation. So uh, you can use, it. for instance, some people have some side effects of having trouble going to sleep. They don't quite get all the stimulant out of their system, so they have some trouble with initial insomnia, give them clonidine, and make them tired to go to sleep. The clonidine itself actually reduces especially impulsivity and aggression. Uh, so it's not rare that you'll see that used in combination with stimulants. This, this is uh, very interesting and kind of counterintuitive. This comes out of the Texas Medication Algorithm Project, and their new recommendations are if you have ADHD and comorbid anxiety, and 25% and of kids who have ADHD uh, qualify for an anxiety disorder also. Uh, is to now this wouldn't be this is not true with uh, OCD okay but usually it's like generalized anxiety is instead of treating the anxiety with a, a separate drug which might usually be an SSRI is go ahead and treat them with a stimulant and in about uh, six weeks half of these kids that have anxiety disorder anxiety goes away now why I say it's counterintuitive is people said yeah but they're already anxious you know give them something to, revs them up a little bit to make it more anxious, but actually probably what's happening here, this is, uh, I mean, it's just an empirical finding. A lot of the anxiety goes away, but it almost certainly it's because, why are they anxious? Because their whole life, they're failing. They're failing at making friends. You know, they're getting rejected. There's family conflict. They're, you know, doing poor academically. This stuff starts to improve and they calm down. So rather than loading this kid up with additional drugs, give it a try and see if that one drug alone is going to make a difference.